Bigger round of applause, please. Thank you. They were great. Thank you to Aaron and Steven. I am really, really excited for this next uh, fireside chat with two incredible food systems advocates who I admire so much, I can't even tell you, my heart is about to burst. Um, first is best-selling author, historian, and Julia Child Award recipient, Tony Tipton Martin, who serves as editor-in-chief of, of Cook's Country Magazine. And joining her in conversation is Chef Adrienne Lipscomb, the founder of the 48 Acres Project. As I said, she's also a chef. She's been a city planner. She's studying to be an architect. She's a really great friend, everyone. I suggest you reach out to her if you need a friend anytime. <laughs> um, I... I, I just need to say again that they are the true, two of the, the truly greatest people I know. So you are in for a treat. Please enjoy this conversation and give them a warm round of applause. Hello. Hey, everybody. It's a little quiet in here. My goodness. Are y'all warm? Because I'm, I am warm. Thank you for joining us today um, as we're rounding out the kind of the end of South by. Oh, Lord, thank Jesus. It's been, it's been a hectic year. Um, I am truly, truly honored to be sitting on stage with Tony. Um, a lot of people do not know. Tony and I have some deep-rooted backgrounds um, in Austin, in fact. Um, while I was going to school uh, for my PhD in city planning, um, what she doesn't really know is, well, she probably does now, but um, I, like, stalked her. I thought we met through Hoover. And Hoover, but I got really lucky. So um, if you know Hoover Alexander, um, he's known me for since I was 18, so I stalked him as well. And um, we met through Hoover, and the relationship in her knowledge of, of, of one Austin is is quite amazing um and then our food and our food and our food history and you know today on our talk my my background is in city planning and i really looked at land access and especially how minorities have land access and how it impacts them when things change such as y'all know that word gentrification right that's a huge buzzword um but when it came to food and the challenge and access to food and how it does your culture, um, I was literally ecstatic when I was gonna be able to have this conversation with you about that. Um, so I know I'm about to, I'm, I, I don't wanna take too much time, but one well, of the things I- Let me I'm, just say, I'm, yeah. I am really happy to be here with you. Oh, thank you. And I'm gonna tell a secret too. Oh, my goodness. Um, so when I was living here, I, well, first of all, it is really exciting. Thank you, Danny, for having me back in Austin. I've just recently moved to Houston, but being here at Bar was actually uh, one of the first places I became passionate about historic preservation and the importance of land um, and pursued finding a historic space in Austin, which I couldn't uh, deliver on. But I had this event here uh, called Soul Summit, and I held it on Juneteenth weekend at historically black college, Houston Tillotson, and I invited 10 of my closest food friends to be here to speak and enlighten the community. And the reason that I met Adrian is because Hoover said, I've got this incredible baker. You will not believe, on top of all of her other um, talents and pieces of wisdom that she'll share with you, she's an amazing baker. And so she made these incredible mango fritters. I tell this story everywhere. We had um, a shoebox lunch. For those of you that know that that was a, a thing during segregation, African Americans could not stop and buy food. So they carried lunch in their shoeboxes. And so we had a shoebox lunch at HT. And um, we discovered near the end of the event that a lot of the boxes that were still stacked were partially empty because people had taken the fritters out. There, there's a person in the audience that, that did that. We won't point her out. She's that great. <laughs> so thanks for having me. Um, so I really want to talk about the challenges of land access. Is, is that okay? That's okay. Um, so if you know Austin and know Austin's history about segregation, if not, um, it's worth really looking up and we don't have enough time to really dive into that. But 
Um, as a person who really is an advocate about land access for BIPOC farmers and especially for black farmers, how in your journey and the work that you've done have you seen it be so hard and challenging personally because I know I know you have in, in getting land, but how have you seen it developed even to today on trying to access land? So that's a really good question. And um, I think we've been hearing all along throughout these panels various inklings of what these obstacles are, whether they're financial, whether they're zoning issues. Um, I encountered all of that. Um, I, this, everyone in the city knew that I was interested in restoring a historic house as a space like this for African American food history. I wanted to preserve our culture, culture in a building that had direct connection to black history. And so there was one freestanding building left in the city that was associated with the original Sam Houston College. And um, I worked very closely with the family trying to obtain that property, wasn't able to do it, and then discovered a few blocks away in East Austin another property. Mm. Um, and I think we heard Sonia talking about the issues in East Austin, like with um, the quality of the land and the soil, and right, so it's, there's so many barriers, but some of it is just in the, the owners that have the properties right. that aren't really, sure of the value of what they have. Oh, they're sure today, let me, nope. let me correct. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah, know sure. now, but they I, know. I left here uh, 11 years ago when gentrification was just starting to happen, and people were not seeing that that land in East Austin held the value that it did. So the point of my work is to make sure that people understand the history of how the land served our community and not just through the classic expressions of farming and sharecropping and those conversations that we typically have. My new book is talking about the garden to the glass. Did, did y'all hear she said a new book? <laughs> I wasn't the only one. <laughs> it is hot up here. I'm just going to let y'all, you know, I know it's hot down there, but whoo, up here it is, it is really kicking. Um, so one thing, so I'm from Texas, originally from Texas. I'm from San Antonio, and my family's from the Hill Country. Um, my great-grandfather told us, when you have children, buy land. It was number one, buy land, because it provided an identity, creates a community, and it's also a sanctuary and can make a business. So when we got our first child, we bought land. We bought land in San Antonio. But I've always carried that with me. And I never really knew why I was carrying that, 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 that statement. Out of everything he's told me in my life, that was the statement that he, I, I carried with me. And I really didn't discover how important it was until we tried to buy land. Um, I have a project in part of a group called the Maloma Foundation in which we decided to purchase land in St. Helena Island in the Gullah Geechee and we purchased 40 acres of land. And with purchasing this land, we knew right away that we couldn't show our face. That we were gonna have to work with a middle person because the land ownership was white. And they've owned the land for over 40 years. So we already knew right away that we probably were gonna have to take a step back and let our realtor handle this because we knew that just because of the color of our skin, could change the dynamic of this deal. And I see that very often, even with farmers that are trying to extend and buy more land, and even for just housing. Have you seen or experienced things of this nature in the work that you do? I do. So as I alluded to earlier, um, the second place that I tried to get in East Austin had formerly been a place of reconciliation in the 30s. Black and white women educators bought a house and they used it as a cultural center where they could hold meetings and teach, other, teach women other um, aspects of life and uh, was basically a space of uplifting women. Um, this place had been in disrepair. It served as a church over the years. Um, UT students in architecture had been participants in the revi revitalizing of the house. And, um, but it was falling, it was dilapidated by the time wind of it got to me. 
you were describing being white, um, having an identity is also a problem, right? right? So when I went to the current owners, the only issues, they, well, they own the property free and clear, but they um, owed back taxes. So they owned it, but they had taxes. I brought in the UT student who did all the architectural work for it to become a church to prove to them that my passion and interest were in saving the house, not occupying it as a personal residence, as an outsider. Right. But I'm not from here. So even if I had black skin, I was still an outsider. Right. So um, I, took, I took the architect, I took renderings of what we were going to do, because UT helped me do, get those. Um, we talked about the ways that the, I had founded a nonprofit so that children, we heard about that earlier as well, um, children could come into the garden that we were going to put in this property so that they could learn healthy eating, um, taste foods that were foreign to them. Um, I had been working with kids in East Austin who had never even had apples right. before. And that was traumatic to me to discover. So I knew that I wanted to give back to the community. And I tried all different ways. We had partnered with um, the Edible Austin and held something that we called the Children's Picnic in East Austin. So I was doing all of these things in the community that were making people aware of my seriousness. So um, after I made this presentation, the property was donated to um, a uh, large established homeless nonprofit in the city. And the next day I got a phone call. And those people said to me, um, hey, everybody in town knows that you're looking for this historic piece of property on the east side. And um, we want to give you the first right of refusal for the low, low price of $400,000 for something you got for free. And I, I was mortified. I just like packed up and left Austin after that. I was so aggravated. And I, I knew that I had a passion to preserve black food history through um, land ownership. Um, but clearly, the timing was not right here. So I worked on books instead. And they are damn good books, by the way. <laughs> and speaking of a book, because there's one beautiful one sitting in your lap. Um, how do you wrap in land and culture in the work that you're doing right now in your award-winning books? By the Go, way. girl. <laughs> so I've been going from city to city. I had to actually mark the pages. I have cheat notes. Um, but what's important, what, one of the things that I wanted to teach uh, in this space was about the history of African-American foods and not just the food, but the people behind the food. We always talk about the recipes. We always talk about cooking. We even talk about farming. But we seldom talk about the individuals. And none of that happens without people. So um, I wrote a book to, uh, well, I, I was trying to find real people in, in history. And I decided to look for them in cookbooks, because that was a format that was normal to me. And um, I now am the owner of 450 of the oldest and rarest black cookbooks that go back to 1827. Yay. I'm trying to catch up. But what's interesting about those books is that they give us a whole view into what black food culture has been like. We hear about sharecropping. We hear about cotton picking. We hear about soul food. We hear about juke joints. Like, we hear about all these things that have some difficult story attached to them. And I'm not Pollyanna, <laughs> but I raised children who had to go to school in the suburbs in Round Rock, and the first thing they always heard you know, at the beginning of the school year is about enslavement and the beginning of America. And, you know, there was just such a sad story for them. I wanted them to know more about mm -hmm. their ancestors. And so what I have learned is that the land has been a way for people to provide financial and economic freedom for themselves. That sound familiar from my great grandfather? We have, we have stories that we have never heard about enslaved women who used small plots of land to, um, small gardens on the um, landholder's property. If they were 
charged with um, ten, tending the, vet, the fruits and vegetables. They right. would hide their fruits and vegetables inside the garden because nobody was going to be looking for the okra right. out there. Um, and so we know that they began doing that, bringing their agricultural practices and embedding them in the plantation economy. Um, but beyond that, there were also free people that used land to provide for their freedom, to buy their children, to put them into schools and educate them. There are so many stories of women. There's a woman named Sally Scott, who was a free woman who owned land in Virginia, and she uh, developed it as an orchard and sold wine. There are women who were brewers and tavern owners who owned the property, but they had to um, be embedded in their husband's record keeping because right. women were not allowed to own property. So we can just hear, oh, and lastly, there's another Austin connection. There's a woman named Bertie Brown. Have you guys heard of the Bertie Brown moon uh, whiskey? Yay, somebody knows about it. Uh, Bertie Brown was a homesteading woman in Montana. And she was known for her hospitality, served in her home and through her moonshine. And in Austin, there are two companies that have actually started a Bertie Brown whiskey. And oh, one wow. of them is located right here. I mean, our history is deep, y'all. It's, it's deep. But I also, you know, find that you have to have a lot of passion to do this. And it takes a lot of work because the stories are hidden. And sometimes they're in plain sight and we just don't know about it because we're not educated in that information. And so one thing I have to say is we're very lucky to have you. Thank you. To be able to do this and uh, you know, I get to call her and be like, hey girl. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, we're coming down a little bit on time, but I wanna talk about the hope of the future. Like where do you see us going in the future with this information? Because we talk about the history, we talk about the past, and we've had plenty of discussions talking about the heartaches and the struggles and the survival. But what about the future? I'm excited, but I'm concerned. Uh, and most people ask me in recent months if I'm concerned because of the erasure of our history, and I laugh and say, are you kidding? It's been erased and marginalized all along. So like, why are you in a panic? Um, but what I am most proud of is the fact that my work, which is not about me, and everyone who knows me knows that I mean that right. sincerely. It is about the names. And my books are full of names because I want the next generation to find a name that resonates for them or a career path that resonates for them or a a, a food choice that resonates for them, and to convert that into a restaurant business or um, restaurant design. Like, I want the next generation to do whatever they want. And the, hence, the name of my second book is Jubilee, because I felt like telling these stories means we're all free. The next generation is free to report on whatever they, to become whatever they want and not be in tangled in the stereotypes that have ensnared us for generations and made us frustrated, made us give up, lose hope, have no pride. Um, but it also um, makes the broader community free as well. And when I say that, I mean, we, it means all the people that aren't black now can go into a black space, a restaurant, and no longer keep looking for soul food. Let that go. <laughs> Yeah. This next generation, this next generation is doing what resonates for them. And as I've heard some of you guys say, it's black because I said so. You know, so uh, I'm excited and hopeful about that. But I am worried. I'm worried as an old dinosaur that um, all of the vehicles that have made it possible for this next generation to, to stretch and grow and fly like the internet, um, are also taking advantage of them. And so when we are, we've been excluded from all these industries, now we're a hot commodity and everybody wants the next generation to come and be their influencer. And I've taken heat about this online. Um, they, want us, they want you to be their influencer and you can't just be happy that you got a box a product or your face on a website or um, 
a, a few small dollars. I, I want you guys to go and really make a difference, but also become economically stable. And I'm worried about that part. I can understand that. Because I can definitely tell you, especially in the social media world, when reached out, you know, we're not seeing the same dollar bill that our, our counterparts are seeing when it comes to social media. Thank you, Blue. Um, and, and also only being really celebrated once a month, once a year. Well, now twice. We now get twice. Tea. Yeah, we have Juneteenth, but um, as as a woman, three times a year. Three times. Hey, I get go a little luck right there. Um, but you know, being the next generation, um, I really see what you're talking about and what is happening with us in our generation and moving forward because social media spreads information so fast, um, and it becomes pretty much one viral on some, some occasions, sometimes positively and sometimes negatively. Um, I am afraid myself that it is going to be a quick flash in the pan on some of these occasions, and, and we're going to be not really celebrating the story, but the action. And I feel um, that a lot of us that are in social media, we're kind of pushed to be in the, the media light because sometimes that's the only way we can get our, our point across. Do you ever feel that way sometimes, especially with our younger generations? I absolutely do, and I think that the, that's what makes the effort that you guys have done with the 40 Acres Project so important, because you have collaborated. I came up at a time when there was only room for one. And my I call sweet that the friend, Highlander. Anybody seen Highlander? I'm aging myself. Yeah, but, there, yeah. there was only one at a time. And initially, I think with social media, people were worried, like, I'm the one, so they don't have room now. And that is not true. Right. What you guys are doing is finding your own way, your own voice, but by collaborating, there's strength in that number. And you guys were able to get that incredible grant, right? Like, yeah. a lot of money. $1.8 million grant from the Mellon Foundation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, when I was here, even though I couldn't penetrate the real estate situation, I was still able to use land and opportunities um, through collaborations. Collaborations with the city, with UT Austin in particular, with um, Edible Austin. Mm. We had an incredible alliance that allowed us to advance the conversation. Um, and I wanna, I guess, kind of respond to the previous comment you made about um, how easy the internet has made it look. It's so easy to look at this work and maybe be dismissive of it or just see stuff on the internet and think it's, that information's everywhere. Right. And it is everywhere now. Right. But 20 years ago, the idea of learning about Sally Scott and her orchard or the woman who grafted oranges in Southern California and created the navel orange. We have Did you long, hear me? A yeah. black woman made that. And, and we don't know any of that history. Mm. So I'll leave you with this. Um, somebody recently sent me a note and said, hey, African-Americans, did you hear this story that African-Americans don't eat vanilla ice cream? Did you hear this? No. Don't eat I vanilla ice cream in public because um, of uh, Jim Crow. Mm. So you know me, I did a really fast Google search. And um, through several searches, it, I tied it to our friend. Michael Twitty. Oh. And Twitty, some years ago on his blog, said that um, he heard, he got this story from Maya Angelou. So I, being a good, diligent journalist, went all the way back to Maya Angelou. I did not just say, oh, great, Twitty, you right. know, told us this, because I love and trust him. Um, and everybody should do the research themselves. But what Maya Angelou says is it was she was in a, a town that seemed so racist it's as if I black see. people could not eat vanilla ice cream in public and that's why we started eating butter pecan there's lots of other theories maybe it's because we worked on plantations in texas where there were pecan trees like True. there's a lot of other rationales that require us to dig a little mm -hmm. bit deeper so I haven't gone out public because I don't have time to study that it's not my space. Yeah. Um, but I encourage everyone to look closer 
to the things you hear. I encourage the next generation to be careful about how you speak and to make sure you are being paid what, you're earned, what you are owed so you can buy land. Yep, so get paid, <laughs> buy land, and do your research. <laughs> Very done. Good. And, and we're out of time. Man, that was too short. But let me tell you, we're getting off this stage. It's hot. Thank y'all so much. Wait, wait, wait. You know, if you follow me on social, you know I got to have my, social, my picture. Wait, Danny. Oh, she has to get that picture of the audience. Everybody say hi. Wait, wait, wait. She's not ready. We talked about social media, right? All right. Oh, oh, okay. Hey, hey. Hey, everybody. Okay, say. Oh, shit. It's doing it again. She's trying to work her phone. <laughs> I promise you, she knows how to work it. All right. Okay, wait. You got it? Okay. All right. Okay. My Woo! mouth was like wide open. All right. Thank y'all so much. Keep clapping. Keep clapping. I love these two folks. Thank you so much to Tony and Adrian. For those of you who are here in person, you have a special chance to receive a signed copy of Tony's newest book, Juke Joints, Jazz Clubs, and Juice, Cocktails from Two Centuries of African-American Cookbooks, if you become a Food Tank member at any point this afternoon. So you can go to registration where my friend Kenzie is, or you can go over to Elena, also my friend, and she'll give you a book too. Um, so all you have to do is uh, scan the QR code on your program. It's on the first page or go to foodtank.com slash join. Again, that's foodtank.com slash join and find a membership level that works for you. And then once you, you become a member at any level, just show your receipt to a volunteer or Kenzie or Lena or me, and we'll make sure that <clears throat> you get that signed copy. And I hope that everyone here will become a member, not just because of the book, but because it's important that Food Tank is able to put on events like these where we can bring all sorts <clears throat> all sorts of different people together. Elaine, I'm gonna ask you to bring me my water. I apologize. <clears throat> so these free summits are only, thank you so much. These free summits are only possible because of grassroots members, like so many of you in this room. You'll be, you will, as a member, you will be able to join monthly membership, only virtual events and very special, where we have very special VIP guests. 